Want to know more about rock, jazz, rhythm, and blues? You gotta start from the bottom up. The Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show with David C. Gross and Tom Semioli. Two bass road warriors tell tales, interview the greats, and spin more great music than you can shake a chap and stick at. The Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show. With your hosts, David C. Gross and Tom Semioli, every Monday at 8 on Cygnus Radio. Hi, this is David Gross for the Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show on CygnusRadio.com. Tonight, along with my co-host, head honcho for Know Your Bass player Tom Semioli, we have Benny Reitveld, who has played with everyone from Miles Davis to Sheila E. to Santana, and he's just an all-around great guy. So let's start right now. Hey, Tom. How you doing, Ben? How are things in Oakland? Not in Oakland, in Los Angeles. Oh, you're in Los Angeles. Well, that's close enough. Yeah, yeah close. Same state. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, I used to live in the Bay Area. Where do you live in LA? Uh, in kind of uh, in the West Side, more like okay. Westwood. All right, okay, yeah. yeah I was out in uh, Burbank actually. I was at the Oakwood Apartments. Oh which, yeah, which we called the Chokewood. Those are fam- those are famous. Uh, it's a famous place. <laughs> yes. Were you guys in New York? Yeah, yeah. We're freezing. Actually, it was a pretty day today. We actually had a decent day. Today. Yeah. Where are you? Where are you at? About? I'm in the country. I'm up in the place called the Bronx. Oh. <laughs> and re- yes, the rural, the rural part of <laughs> New York City. <laughs> That's and, way up, way up there. Yeah, we're God's country. And David, where in where in Connecticut are you? I'm in uh, Woodbury, which is part of Litchfield County. Oh, wow! I grew up on 68th and Broadway. I'm a real city kid. Yeah, yeah. No, when I was living there, I loved taking the train to Connecticut. There was yeah. man, the, the the route. You know, driving was a drag, but the route when you took the train it was like all oh, this beautiful. Beaches and oh, the Metro beaches. North. You talking? You yeah, yeah, Metro that? North. Yeah, oh, the Metro yeah. North is beautiful. It's fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had friends that lived in you know certain. Uh, I think they lived in in Greenwich and they lived in uh, what's the one before Greenwich? This small college town. Oh, oh, so, um, that would be New York, though. That so that would. Be- <laughs> it's not like it's a big college town or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, Greenwich is your first. Stop. Oh, was it West oh, Haven? It's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's like Black Haven Rock. Westport. Yeah, yeah, Westport, Black Rock, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Purchase? Yeah. No, my wife is throwing out names here. But it's yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful train ride. I miss it. I miss being in New York, actually. Yeah, it uh, doesn't look like. Well, I mean, since COVID, it's really it's been a it's been a very strange place. Like my wife and I were in. Manhattan yesterday, and we have a place in Manhattan. And just to see Madison Avenue desolate, walking down Madison Avenue, and you know, you still have many of the luxury shops have closed, many of them are open. But it's very yeah. surreal to see these, you know, pretty girls behind the counters and the guards at the doors, and there's nobody in there. It's almost like being on a movie set before the director calls action, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. suspended life. So, who really knows how New York City, Manhattan is going to come out of it. I know that rents are really good now, so I might have to get a place to get in there. Yeah, you can get a Nice one bedroom apartment for twenty three hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, actually, I, I might. I, I'm, I'm thinking of actually doing that again with some yeah. a friend of mine or something, just to because you know I missed that. Uh, I was yeah. there for twelve years. My son was born there. Uh-huh. You know, it's a, you were know, you so, there? Where were you living? I was a East Villager, so oh great. I can't really see say New Yorker because <laughs> like everyone that's else, a, who never left that bubble. That's a rich neighborhood now. Where in the East Village were you? Oh, I was on uh, mostly on St. Mark's and between First and A. Fifth floor walk up, the whole deal. You know, <laughs> it was great. When you I went shopping at Trash and Vaudeville, right? Place. That's where you got all your uh, every now and then. Yeah, I mean, you know, taxes <laughs> sure. and the, the food. You know, I was at Cafe. Mogador all the time. That of course, was, yeah, sure. Uh, I was like, I lived there. I literally was next door to it. So. <laughs> what, what years were you there? Uh, uh, two, uh, 2002 to 2014, I think, something like were that. Were you there when uh, St. Mark's uh, Music Store was there, I think it was, that old music store? No, that was before my time. Oh, maybe that was a bit before. Okay. That but there, was a guitar, there was a, a guitar repair guy. Oh, what was his name? I went there once. I think he was on St. Mark's. And it was, I forgot his name, though. He was an old guy. And, you know, one of those New York stories. Right. Like that like that CD place on First Avenue. Oh, Sounds. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is gone now, finally. But Yeah, yeah. I spent the, well, I used to, when, in my music journalism days, I would, I would sell all my advanced copies to Sounds. Yeah, 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 exactly. Man, that guy had tons. It was like just yeah. like a hoarder. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all those great yeah, trombolis. Oh yeah, up. Oh, yeah, I don't even talk about. Yeah, so that's why I got to get back there at least. Yeah, but it's not yeah. there anymore though. That's the sad. Part, you know? Yeah, I know. There's a lot of places that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll you probably know, hate it, but then you know. Yeah. 
the bookstores are gone. I know you had St. Mark's Comics and St. Mark's Books. Those, yeah, it, yeah. it really is. It's interesting when people who come back and they're just shocked at how so yeah. many of the places are gone now. It's not the yeah. same, even from your yeah, but, you know, it, it wasn't, as, you know, it's, it's always, you know, I have to kind of accept that Pe- things yeah. change, you know. And, you know, I still, got, I still got some good friends there. So, you know, I have a cop fun anyway you know i think it'd be fun i mean it would be as annoying as it was back then too you just forget the annoying parts you know you still have two boots pizza so what, what i mean oh excellent yes good <laughs> no, I mean. so benny what have you been doing in this in this horrific lockdown now what have you been doing musically anyway i've been writing a lot actually uh i am um, part of this uh kind of composers collective uh that apparently they used to meet <clears throat> live before the pandemic so a friend of mine said hey you should come to this online meeting every every week and so a bunch of composers and some are new some are kind of experienced some are you know uh veterans and uh we started just collaborating on music and and so that's been fun you now we just do that the you know, i've made some good friends and uh we write songs together i've been writing stuff for myself and mostly just helping my son out because I'm around now, you know. So he's, you know, he's a teenager, so he's, and he's into music. So I'm doing the filling in the gaps, horrid music system. How old is he? Uh, he's 17 now, yeah. Uh, my daughter's 16. Yeah, so it's like, uh-oh, college, you know, like this is last year. Exactly. college thing you know auditioning setting up his drum room he's a drummer primarily so um, yeah so that, that's that's been it really you know and learning to cook you know and uh, yeah. <laughs> I recently saw a picture of you and your son weren't you in a, like some sort of cowboy you weren't oh, a, yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah yeah that's a friend of mine well the, the person that did this music video for me uh, Christmas my Christmas song she was such a she's so good and we hit it off and so she said hey you want to I need some extras and my Real Western that I'm making. It's like oh, fine, so, sign me up. You know, so um, we were just it was it was a good hang, good fun. You, know, hey, just, you look good in the clothes. That's about yeah. Right. It's, not, it's props to their their uh, costume department. You know? <laughs> <laughs> made me look legit. <laughs> it took a long time to wait for um, a music while you were doing a music video. Film is, is it's hurry up and wait from yeah. beginning to end. Really, yep, it is. It's like uh, yeah, ever, even the music videos we used to do. You know, Santana or whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's what it's about, and it still is to this day. You know, you just you just hurry up and wait. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot. What I like about I love music, uh, film production in in particular, because unlike music, there's so many more moving parts to right. have sync up just to get one shot. You know, I, mm-hmm. so there's something about that that really I just because I'm not from that world. I'm from the world of anybody can do anything and be drunk as shit or whatever and actually come out and record and, hey, sounds good. <laughs> you know, it's just different, you know, and I kind of, I guess. It's interesting how musicians have such an affinity for film and vice versa. I mean, you even see even even guys like, you know, even you know Ray Davies with all the films he's made. Uh, yeah. And, of course, even Paul McCartney doing animations and then a couple of films on his own. Yeah. So. And I think you'll find a lot of bass players always turn into photographers or something. Yes, Rick Laird. Great. Rick Laird, who unfortunately... Mill Hinton. Yeah, Mill Hinton. Bill you know. Wyman, come on. Bill yeah, Wyman, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, seriously, it, I think it's because the bass is sort of an, an overview instrument. You know, yeah. we, there's... I don't know, there's something about that that's connected with photography, film or something, you know, like there's a big, it's a big picture kind of thing, you know. Well, that's what the bass player, I, I liken it to a catcher on a baseball team, yeah, where you yeah. have to know what everybody's doing. You position the field as you let them know whether there's going to be a fly. Oh, yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and then, of course, who gets the least amount of attention on the field? Yeah, yeah the exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always tell base students, you know, I hope you're not doing this for any kind of personal ego gratification because you're not going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> but you came to the base from the piano, right? You were a piano student at six. And yeah. Then you, and then yeah. you had a mentor, a uh, uh, a Henry who helped you out. Yeah, and yeah, a music teacher, yeah. yeah. How did you grab, and, and I, I understand your first bass was a plastic Hagstrom. Well, it had a plastic, uh, fi- I mean, I, I think it was, there was wood somewhere in it, but I remember the back uh, was actually kind of naga hide or something. It was really oh, wow. kind of bizarre. And the front was uh, kind of a plastic thing, and it looked, there, it looked like there was a speaker grill between the yeah, two, yeah, they used to have those, yeah, 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 but it wasn't even, a, it wasn't anything. It was just, and something. they had these buttons that did nothing too. Uh, well, they had some switches, and I wish I still had that thing, but 
It was pretty fun, and that was, that was cool. I bought it off uh, this surfer dude uh, in Hawaii. I grew up in Hawaii, and he sold me that and a Gibson SG Junior guitar for seventy five bucks. You know, wow. and, man, I didn't even know what I had. You know, whatever. You know, but uh, it was fun. And I remember it was he had put on the front wallpaper. Yeah, it was it was white with black, a uh, kind of French style felt kind of. You know, French, uh, New Orleans kind of style. It was all on the front of it. So I, I had to take it off after a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. How did you gravitate towards the bass? What made you? Well, let's see. Pretty much like every other bass player, we just got shunted off <laughs> into that. <laughs> I was playing drums with my cousin Fred, and, uh-huh. and we had a band. We had a trio, power trio, you know, and we did gigs and there's high school dances and all that. Right. And then we, we lost our bass player, and we didn't know any other musicians except except one other drummer. So he, he said, well, we only know this drummer, so maybe, maybe you should just play bass. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it works, you know. And but, you just taught yourself the scales and things? Yeah, well, I mean, I remember I had a guitar before that, and I, I was learning stuff, you know, by the Beatles, and, and so, yeah, I, so I liked the bass anyway. I was learning the first bass line on that plastic Sears guitar was the bass line from Ballad of John Yoko, which is great. It's like, oh, I got I learned what a 12-bar blues was. Right, there you go. What it was called, you know. So, uh, and then uh, I had my cousin's bass, and I was trying to learn Lovely Rita, Meter Maid. That's a nice and it had, you know how it has all those skips? Oh, yeah. And, and I was doing this, you know. And he said, you know, you could use the other strings, too, you know. <laughs> I went, oh, wow, really? Oh, cool, yeah. I was like 12 or whatever. I'm just curious. How do you go from the Netherlands to Hawaii? I mean, could there have been a wider yeah. um, I know. of a continent, huh? No, and it's actually, in, t- in terms of time zones, it's 12 hours. It's, it's, it's exactly the opposite end of the earth. But that was just, I don't know, I was, I was just a year old. I, don't, oh, wow. I know that my parents, because they had to flee this persecution in Indonesia, so, so they want, I think they had a sponsor to go to the United States anyway, but they had to go to Holland first to some kind of, kind of uh, uh, not a relocation camp, but... Uh, a kind of a camp where you kind of get settled and repatriated and all right, this. Right. And then I guess we had a sponsor or something in California. We first stopped in California for a year or two. And then okay. and I, I, I guess my dad had a job in Hawaii or something. So, yeah, that's uh, you know pretty confusing and not all that spectacular. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious because, you know, growing up in New York City, we were the first to get all the new records. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so jealous so of that. I'm, I'm thinking, how how much later did, did you get stuff? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a thing. It really was a thing. I mean, in fact, I, I was just reminded that even our TV show, you know, the serial Batman and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Often, often we would get stuff a week later. Really? Okay. Yeah, you know, because I guess they didn't have the technology to just. Do it at the same they probably night. had to send the tapes to the local yeah. station. It's not like and, satellite. Yeah. You know, and no so idea. they didn't. And I guess they didn't want to send it. But you know, start. Oh, you know, now you can show it up. So usually Wednesday, you show it on a Friday. So right. they usually just waited till the next Wednesday. You know, and I, I forgot about that. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. We had a lot of. There was a lot of lag there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But it. But it was cool. You know, what was cool about it was that it. And even it still applies to this day a little bit. It became its own little weird, like its own culture, you know, mm-hmm. very, you know, like really unique and sort of insular, but in, not in a, not, not in a bad way, but it were, it became a really tight musical community. It was very, really cool. And it's one of the only other places in the United States besides New Orleans that has its own indigenous music. Right, right, right. And they're totally behind it. It's like a music, their music, they're behind pro music over there. And they have like three radio stations, maybe four, that specifically only play music from Hawaii or produced in wow. Hawaii. Oh yeah, no, it's off the hook over there. It's even even with the internet and everything, it's still a pretty unique like little microcosm of you know, it's, When you it's think cool. of so many bass players of your generation, they're usually from Chicago, Philly, yeah. Atlanta, yeah. New York. Yeah. So you grew up around a totally different type of music. I mean I'm sure you had commercial radio there, but still yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we did. But and also when I was a kid, I, I only had these, you know, crappy radios, so I couldn't even hear the bass usually right, anyway. Of course, yeah. <laughs> you know, like just <laughs> you know, like okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was an interesting, weird, you know, um, 
way of, of learning the bass, you know, and um, and I kind of was on my own. Like, I remember I was slapping. Uh, I didn't know what slapping was, and I didn't, you didn't see a lot of examples at the time. Right, they were uh, yeah, and nobody, and plus, I wasn't in, you know, on the mainland, so I couldn't go see people doing it live. Right, right, live. So I, I was like, I just heard it, and I was, I started doing it with this, like this. You know, <laughs> and then finally I saw like uh, some video. I was like, "Oh, oh, it's like that." Okay, <laughs> because this is really like kind of so that that was it was. And great... then you go you 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 go to University of Hawaii, which yeah. was a, a great music school. Oh yeah, yeah, good. Uh, at the time, it was a great composition class. I, I mentioned composition, okay. and it was a great composition and ethno music. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of nice uh, night Wednesday nights. Uh, they had the gamelan concerts, and it would be on the grass, you know. And it's Hawaii, and you'd smell mm -hmm. those Indonesian cigarettes, and every now and then you'd smell weed, you know. It's like really? it was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I guess that gives you more of a compositional approach to the instrument, and in the sense of just not thinking yourself as a bass player, but something an instrument that's part of a bigger picture yeah maybe yeah i don't think i thought that way at first because i yeah. was too young i'm mean, I just like learn the bass line you know I, it, it took me a, a lot longer to realize i think the actual uh function of the bass you know in terms of most types of modern music you know mm. because i was no one could teach me you know it wasn't until i got my ass kicked with the crusaders and i realized Oh shit! Okay, that's how you're. What the bass is about. <laughs> so it was a it was a good thing. Um, but yeah, it took me a while, you know, to get to that. You know, and that's and now, and you no, no. And now, yeah, maybe I do approach it from a compositional standpoint, but more in that I studied the masters, how they would, you know, like compose their bass lines and build mm -hmm. them up, like Chuck Laney or something like that. You know, yeah. So um, yeah, so it's, I, I was sort of a backwards development but you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> but that's when you started working professional when you were at university of hawaii right and you started well i guess you when when acts came to hawaii you were the you were the house band i would imagine. one of yeah 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 a lot of times but it was mostly in the jazz world because i was playing upright also oh okay and, yeah and uh we had a and a very unique situation where we were playing mainstream bebop five nights a week in one place for years like you know because Hawaii is a, you know, it's a very touristy, you know. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you had a fresh audience all the time. So, yeah, we were there at this place called the Cavalier for, for years, playing standards all, like, four hours a night, you know. It was kind of a, a really, really unique, great developmental phase. Right place to do your apprenticeship because standards in top 40, I mean, that's that's pretty much everything. Yeah, yeah. And then I played, you know, in top 40 bands and weddings and the whole thing. So that was that was my you know my learning ground. You know that was a fabulous time. It was great. There was a yeah. big jazz resurgence in Hawaii, and it was cool. It was really cool. So, so to this day, I have all these standards just etched in my memory of chorus after chorus of every you know like you know east of the sun, west of the moon, whatever you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was always the the jam sessions, a lineup of horn players, about fifteen of them, you know, and they all have like millions of choruses to. Sure, they to got them. Say, you know, <laughs> so that's like, that's the bane of their. That's the whole point of their existence. Yeah, yeah. I'm over there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what, you, what you should have done is played the tunes in E F sharp, <laughs> and, yeah. and really screw with them. Oh, we well actually okay. We're uh, we did that once. Where is this? Yeah. And it was such a dick move. I can't even believe. But, you know, you're kids. You know, you do all this punky stuff. So this one guy came in. He was going to do the take the A train. It's in C. And, you know, there's that intro. You know. And I, we just said, let's do, let's do it in C sharp. So when we do the intro, he won't know because he's not playing. And he comes in. <laughs> we laughed. And, yeah, yeah I'm sure he... Listen, I, can, I confess, as, as someone who played top 40 all through college, we did the exact same thing yeah. for the horn players. Take yeah. it up a half step. But interestingly, I did a session. I, I uh, scored this film, and, I, we, and um, there was a scene where it was uh, supposed to be like kind of like sing, sing, sing. They, the, the production couldn't get the rights to it, so I had to write something similar. And there was this guy, this clarinet player, Jim Rothermel, who's passed, unfortunately, but... But he did the solo, and it was dead on. I mean, it was dead on. But, I mean, he had that whole thing. It was 
flying on that swing style. And but the thing is, it was there was a part where I had to for all these weird reasons I had to be in, in A, not in B flat. Because and I realized because the original Sing 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 is not in B flat. It's in some weird key. And I asked him about that. He was an older guy. And I asked him about it. He said, you know, in those days, back in the 40s, I guess, the horn players didn't care. They just like, whatever key. They learned that way, just whatever, you know. It was only later on, maybe in the 50s, where jazz got B-flatified, you know, <laughs> E-flatified, you know, or something, whatever that is. Yeah. But, yeah, I was I was actually shocked. But in the, the swing era, those guys played in any key. I, I didn't know that, you know. Wow, wow. But, yeah. I guess. I mean, that's, that's what he said. I don't know. Maybe he was just making it up. But, but yeah, so, yes, we're all guilty of doing those dick moves. <laughs> oh, but they're good. But those are the, you know, that's that's the rite of passage. you got to be able to, do, you know, you're a horn player. So we used to do that with the singers, too, taking up a half set. Oh, God. <laughs> one, of them, one of them being John Cicada, who I think is still scarred. No. Yeah, I went to, I was, uh, I was in the top 40 band in my school days with him. And whenever we did um, Earth, Wind & Fire Reasons, you know that break? Yeah, yeah. You do the vocal solo and you come in. Well, man, take it up a half step and you watch. <laughs> That's true. Hey, look, he went on. Look, guy goes on to sell millions of records and Grammys. Yeah. I'm sitting here in the Bronx, you know. Well, so, but from there, now you 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 get a gig with Sheila E. How did that How did that happen? Oh, uh, that was uh, that was after uh, when I moved to the Bay Area. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. What prompted that move? Was that a musical a career it was, choice? Uh, yeah, I just had to because I, at some point I realized, okay, I clearly need some real tutelage on the right. bass. So I got to, you know, get in with the mix and, you know, so I had to leave the farm. Um, and uh, so I moved to the Bay Area because a friend of mine lived there. I said, oh, no. he said, yeah, come over. It's great. There's some great musicians. Oh, cool. What year is this? This is in the... Uh, 1983. Yeah. Okay. So, and a, and a very vital music scene always in the... I lived there for yeah. a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. No, of course. And and as you know, the the Latin jazz scene there, of course, you know. So I got hooked up with, uh, you know, Ray Obiedo. Um, he, he played rhythm guitar with Herbie and really oh, yeah. okay. excellent funk and guitar and kind of a smooth jazz-ish kind mm-hmm. of guy now. Um, really great songwriter, uh, you know, um, and he lived next to somebody I was jamming with and said, hey, you want to play in my band? And that led to Sheila E. coming in because she was part of the musical community there. Right. And, and uh, she came in, sat in at this club, Earl's Salon Club in, in Albany. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she uh, came in and played drums, and I was like, holy shit, this, you know, she, she, was, she was wailing. She was like, <laughs> I mean, absolutely fantastic. Um, so I was like, wow, that was fun. And she said, hey, I'm, I'm, I just recorded a new album. I need a band to go on the road. Do you want to play? You know, because we had a good uh, bass and drums connection. So oh, mm-hmm. I said, sure, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> And then I, and then, but the thing is, I thought it was going to be all this kind of fusion stuff because of the right. way she was playing. And then I get, the, I get the record. And it's, you know, her, the Glamorous Life album. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is different. Uh, I didn't expect that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and I just learned the stuff and we did it and it was fun. Uh, I learned uh, how I really had, uh, we were supposed to dance and do all these dance moves. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. And I was such a crap dancer. It was hysterical. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, there's one. I, I know there's one video I've seen, or a couple of them actually. And you know, you got to think about it. You know, when you're when you're studying and you're composing, uh, you're an artist. But as soon as you step on stage, you're you're an entertainer. You yeah, know? Yeah, and especially yeah. with Sheila E. and Prince, and those, I mean, they were, you know, not only they were incredible players and composers, they were entertainers, man. And well, yeah. and, and it was like masterful. I mean, really. Yeah. And that was what, what I got out of that is yeah. like being able to see Prince work, you know, because we did, we opened up, um, we did the whole Purple Rain tour. Right, right. So we opened up. And so I got to see him every night pretty much, you know. Right. And, and just, I was like, well, first of all, musically, you know, spot on, band was awesome. But then that extra level of stagecraft, that the knowledge of stagecraft he had, um, I, you know the proscenium he had the light lights Roy Bennett lighting director like insanely great mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah it was a great learning experience I'm like wow look at that you know it's probably just more of that same thing about wow theater video you know like yeah definitely a good theatrical sense 
And even in the music, I got a lot from him about developing songs um, yeah. in terms of how, you know, n- nothing remaining too static all the time. Right. Um, you know, re- and putting in some drama when necessary. It was really good. It was great. It's fun. Yeah. What a, what a great college education. I know. Because uh, right? yeah, yeah. if you listen to his records, he, they're, they're multi-genre records. They're not just it's, funk records. Yeah. No, no. It's a... It's all he definitely carried on that tra- that tradition of just melting pot from mm-hmm. Sly, you know, the Family Stone. That just whole like let's throw everything in the pot, see what you know, see what we got, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah I, uh, it was great. It was good. I was very lucky to have done that. So yeah, then of course you know Miles sees you dance and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> "I want him in my band." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do. <laughs> We're going to do a choreography now. Now, <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, that was just apparently. Um, apparently, I say this because I don't really know, and there's so much lore in the music industry. I, yeah. you know, I tend not to, but, but apparently, it was sort of like Miles was looking for a bass player because he was enamored of that style of music and the whole. Oh, thing. he was crossing over as Miles always did. He always crossed over into pop. So, you know, I guess, I guess he, uh, Daryl was leaving and he yeah. wanted somebody that from that era of school, whatever you want to call it. Right, right. And, yeah. Um, and um, apparently they talked, he, uh, management, somebody talked to somebody in the Sheila camp. You know, I don't know who, you know, Sheila, Prince, who the fuck knows, you know, but, but, I, but I did get a call from Alan Leeds. Uh, okay. Was, yeah, Prince's uh, road manager. And he goes, hey, Benny. And I was like, you want to play with Miles Davis? <laughs> you know, <I'm> like, what? <laughs> what are you? Yeah. And this is after I left Sheila, you know. So Okay. I, so I thought, it, you know, uh, Sheila was kind of mad at me for leaving. But um, so I thought it was a joke. So, you know, set up, you know, kind of thing. Right. Everybody, there's every Miles Davis bass player tells the same story. Yeah. yeah. And actually, <laughs> even, yeah, I, even more than bass players, a lot of other people I hear yeah. like, Got calls. He was like, "Ah, this is, a, this is bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> I think Dennis even hung up. Dennis Chambers even hung up. Excellent. I remember. <laughs> yeah, he said, "This is bullshit." Boom. <laughs> and then they had to call him back. No, it's you know. But yeah, so uh, and so that's what happened. Alan asked me, and I said, "Well, of course." And, and so, well, here's Gordon Meltzer's name. You know, number. Let's call him. Called him and said, like, "You know, uh, we need a." Uh, uh, a tape, uh, kind of a tape, a reel, and right. a picture, you know. Um, and uh, so I put together a really hokey reel because I didn't have one, you know. I, had to, <laughs> I didn't have a lot to put on there, you know. It was and this of, is the uh, days before, uh, you know, iPhones, so you really before, had a cool before, before everything, before, you know, yeah, electricity. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I was putting together this, with my little Porta studio, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I sent it off and miraculously they said okay you know I guess uh, yeah that was how that worked I had to thank probably I know Alan Leeds Sheila Prince maybe I don't know, I don't know. You know cool. I got a great uh, Miles story for you so I'm going to Berkeley College of Music right yeah yeah and uh, Michael Henderson was in the band at that time oh. I I just love me the Michael Henderson stuff yeah and, he he's badass yeah uh, so we. We spent all our money to get tickets to Paul's Mall. All right? Okay. Miles comes on the band's smoking. He's in a pink yeah. leather suit. Okay? Right. <laughs> and he looks at the audience, looks at the band, bah! puts the horn down, and walks off. <laughs> God. What year was that? Oh, that had to be 70... Oh, okay, yeah. 74, 74. Oh, that was, those were some probably wild days, yeah. Oh, wow. And that was it? That was it. Oh, my God. They kept playing, you know, they're doing their thing, and I, my I, I, walked off. I know, I know their pain, because we actually had to do that once. Um, we There was a run at Indigo Blue, which is that club in New York that lasted for a while, it was a really cool club. It was a small club. I forgot. It was Midtown somewhere uh, in a hotel. And we did a three or four night run. And on the fourth night, suddenly we were, uh, we were informed that Miles split his lip. You know, he couldn't play that night. So everyone was like, well, what do we do? Do we just play anyway or do we just cancel? And I guess 
they said, well, we can just play, we'll just play anyway because people are here, you know. And it was then that I realized that, you know, as good as the band was, I mean, we sucked ass, actually, <laughs> without, because the, the arrangements were so miles centric that without that voice, all the arrangements, even if we played them the same way, just fell apart. There was just something about, okay, that the, I don't know, the energy or whatever, you know, that it, it just did not work at all. There was no, it was so weird. And, and it, that's when I really learned, you know, like about how arrangement, you know, arrangement can work if depending on, on an actual player. You know, even Duke mm-hmm. Ellington used to do arrangements for certain musicians, you know, to play, you know, not... So, yeah, that was really interesting. Well, I felt we, we, as soon as we started playing, I think we all realized, oh, this was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Wait a minute. What, what were we thinking? <laughs> I mean, it really sounded great, especially, well, Kenny always sounded fantastic, you know. <laughs> but still, you know, it was just because the arrangements are built around miles. So, what do you, you know, if there's no miles, it's weird. Oh, you know, family leader's not there. And it's weird, other, even weirder, it was Tony Williams was in the audience that night. I was like, oh, my God, Tony Williams. You know? <laughs> and, and he was, like, sitting there really, like, eh. And I remember, <laughs> and he left because he was like, eh. you know, he was just disappointed. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but uh, you probably figured, oh, it's the fourth night. They'll probably be really hot this night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we the, the third night, the Saturday night, is really good, actually. It was really it was great because it was a club, you know, and you're just like in there. Yeah, I like, I love that, you know, um, those, that string of gigs, except for that night. <laughs> but I'm sure Miles obviously wanted you to be yourself when he, when he hired you, but you, you still, you, you know, you think back on all the, all the amazing players. I mean, come on, Dave Holland, Ron Carter, Paul Chambers, Marcus Miller, Daryl, and those yeah. guys. Did you ever think to reference them at all when you were doing some of Miles' older material? Like, for example, sure. I think there's a recording of you on the um, one of the live compilations albums of uh, In a Silent Way, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, well, that Silent Way was sort of like built out of that band. But most, a lot of the other stuff, yeah, I definitely listened to Daryl because, you know, yeah. you know, like, that, you know, how can you not? <laughs> you know? Right, right. So uh, um, a lot of it was that, but the thing about that band is that the, the, the tunes would morph over time. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so if you hear street scenes, Jack Johnson from the seventies and yeah. in the eighties is completely different. And all the tunes kind of morphed that way. Tempos would change, yeah. range would change. And, and he just, he just get it to a point, you know, um, where then it was like the ultimate. And then as soon as that happened, we never played it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really, really interesting. It was, it was, he was a pretty consummate artist in that way. Very, yeah. uh, that was, it was so Buddhist, you know, of just like, okay, that was the best we I'm ever going to play it. I'm, I don't ever want to play it again, you know? Um, and he usually always lived by that. It was, it was yeah. pretty inspiring. Sure. Did he ever direct you on, on any of the bass parts? Because some of those, I mean, some of the stuff yeah. he did with Daryl and Marcus, I mean, interesting. Yeah. He, he had a knack for incredible bass lines. Yeah. Uh, yeah I did. Well, listening to this stuff and also in, a lot of times he would talk to us before the show. Mm-hmm. We'd have a little meeting, you know, and uh, there would be, you know, just you know, suggestions like, you know, here, let you know, make it longer, but be really cryptic sometimes, you know. Some of the comments were like, just put a little lift in it, you know. Uh, what does that actually mean? So I've definitely started listening to older stuff. It's like, well, maybe it's this. And so generally, if I got too many dirty looks from people in the band, then I said, well, I guess that wasn't it. Uh, <laughs> and then if I didn't get any dirty looks, then I was like, okay, I guess this is fine. <laughs> uh, so that's that's kind of how that worked. Uh, but we yeah, really like- have to credit Miles with bringing the electric bass into the in, in, as a part of jazz because if you remember, as we remember. Yeah. Uh, well, you had a uh, Harvey Brooks and, and Dave Holland playing electric. You yeah, had yeah. Ron Carter and and the Jazz Police. They didn't take too kindly to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's to this day. It's kind of it's mysterious why that era is so you know sloughed off. You know, yeah. all the younger. Actually, the funny thing is, all the younger musicians now that are coming up 
they like, oh, that, this is the greatest shit ever. Wow, you know. Right. Um, because they don't have that kind of baggage that a lot of right. them. Right. So, yeah, I, you know. Okay. Jazz and, and Ken Burns' documentary was a perfect example of the Wintonization. I was just yes. thinking. Yeah, was, we're, yeah, uh, with, yeah, When you said that, because of the short shrift that – that Miles got and that kind of jazz in in, in general. Exactly. And and the avant-garde from a few years earlier. Yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. almost like it never existed. Unless you wore a suit, you, yeah, yeah. you were a jazz musician. Yeah, well, he, he is the chief of the jazz police. I mean <laughs> Well yeah, I mean uh, you know and and I, I'm glad that documentary happened. That's great, but it does color people's perception of jazz, you know. I mean, I was also in Hawaii. I was listening to Art Ensemble of Chicago. Speaking of, I love right. these guys. Those guys were fantastic, you know. They really and Anthony Braxton, you know. I was all over that shit, man. I loved it. You know, and of course, you know, think about it. Yeah, you know. and, and Tom is bringing up a good point about the bass players of Miles. If you yes. really think about Miles' music since Bitches Brew, it's always been about the bass. Oh yeah! I even go, it's good. So what? I mean, come on! I mean, yeah. I mean, I know that he's quoted and several actually on yeah. the circle always quoted as saying they listen to the bass, you know, yeah. and and it's true. And also, the bass in general, in I don't know, ninety percent of all music ever is it's it's like the delivery system for everything else that goes on in a song or an album or whatever, because people. Where the bass is concerned with people moving, right? Right. I mean, it's partially acoustically on a frequency level. A lot of it is below our hearing level. You know, it's feel. So that's why it's actually really kind of an important part, but it's also invisible. You know, but all the <clears throat> all the leaders they rely on the bass all the time, all the time. It's just like it's the, like the backbone is, <clears throat> as Carlos always called it. It's like the the backbone of everything, you know, and that's why I tell students that you can't take this lightly. This is, you know, I, I do even the Spider-Man thing, you know, like with great power comes great responsibility. It's, <laughs> it's, it's totally true because you cannot, you know, you think you're, nobody's paying attention, but actually everybody is subconsciously paying more attention than you realize. So, right. They don't even know what the instrument is, unfortunately. And we, that's Absolutely. one of the things I was going to say when you, you know, you started out on your little plastic action with your wallpaper. I yeah. mean, the bass was still a relatively new instrument. Did you ever have to explain to, or how do you explain to civilians? Because they think they, when they see you on stage, you think it's a good, you're just a guitar player. Oh, well, that's a like, hey, slow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, guitar player. <laughs> and they don't even realize you're playing anything until there's one of those breakdown sections. Yeah. And the bass player keeps playing exactly the same thing he's been playing. But that's then, my bass solo. Yes. But then people go, like, "Whoa, yeah." <laughs> How do you explain to civilians what does that thing do? What is that? What is that instrument do? I, I've tried so many different ways. <laughs> um, I just tell them, hey, you know, it's it's the low part that makes you feel the music. You know, okay. and so you know, I just tell them, look, just take any song you know, when you're listening on your little playback system. You know, take it and turn off the bass and then see what happens. You know, that's all I can say. It's like yeah. it's an instrument that's related to the guitar. Um, you know, or the viola da gamba, if you really want to go that far back, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, and I just tell them it's the part that makes you feel the music. You know, that's all I can say. You know, you know, to musicians, it's like, well, okay, there's there's a harmonic, you know, focal point and all that stuff too, and ostinato and drive and all that. But for civilians, yeah, I mean, you want to cook eggs? I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting that the hip hop generation really shed light on that late '60s, early '70s miles. Here, you know, they, they, yeah, how many samples do we hear from on the corner and Big yeah. Fun? Take the record you did with Bob Belden. Oh, now. Bob, yeah. All right. So, you know, in, in reviewing some of the stuff that I had not known you had done, I went right to that, and the first song I go to, which is my favorite Miles tune, or. Bitches Brew is Spanish Key. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that tune, the original, really set the template for all funk. Yeah. You can really go Parliament. You can, that was it. And so I put on the, this version and I'm like, I'm waiting for boom, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. <laughs> yeah, okay. And Belden's great. I, may he rest in peace. I, I knew him back then. Oh, he yeah. He yeah. the China Club with us. It was, it was kind of funny. Yeah. Wow. But uh, like I said, it was the first song I went to. It was such, you guys did such an interesting version of that. It was kind of cool. Yeah, it was, it was the whole India thing. 
And yeah, I, don't, yeah, I, I forgot. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. I don't remember all of the all of the tunes on that. But I do like the way Jean Pierre came out. That was fun. Um, but all those, you're right. I mean, even that Jean Pierre. Boom. Exactly. Boom. You know, it's like one note repeated once. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You know, and that's it. You know, from that, if you're if you're th- there, then a- anything can happen. You know, um, um, that was fun. But yeah, I forgot about Spanish Key. Yeah, it was a little, it was an interesting arrangement. Uh, but you know, I like the fact that people experiment. You know, and not all experiments are going to work. You mm-hmm. know, that's okay. You know, I mean, I think the greats know that um, because you have to get through these failures or whatever less than optimal results to get to the really good stuff anyway. So think about how Pan- Panathalassa came oh, out. Yeah. Bill Laswell did a great job with that. Oh song. yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, he's another insane guy. I love him. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. But, but again, think, 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 another, okay. another overview guy, you know, right. That's just from, and if you listen to his early bass playing, it's so great and, but yeah. fundamental. But because he had the overview thing, and that led him to do all this insanely cool remixes and all that stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. One of the questions I wanted to ask you uh, in particular was, okay, so you're with this icon, not just a great musician, a really great teacher in his own way. Yeah. And then, <laughs> boom, you're in Santana. And yeah. another elder great what a wonderful way to, to look well, at it. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, I guess that's current terminology is blessed, you know, but, um, or, or earlier it would be lucky son of a bitch, you know, uh, <laughs> it's all, it's all that. Um, or sometimes I think, Oh, you know, maybe that's the way the universe works. If you really need, you know, you, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Or kind of thing. And I really needed help. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we better get him to some really good teachers. So, you know, Miles <laughs> and Carlos, you know, and yeah, I mean, they're, it's funny because those two are very similar. Well, you know, Miles, he, uh, well, Carlos is a real disciple of Miles. I mean, he yeah, learned so yeah, much from him. Yeah, and, and he actually carried, always carried on that tradition. I mean, in every, With- always pushing, always pushing to be really present in the music, you know. And doing stuff that people may not even like. Uh, if you remember the Caravanserai album, it was oh, like, really? you know, and it was one. Of my, it's one of my favorite albums. Oh, it's a yeah. masterpiece! Yeah, you know. So yeah, I mean, you can't really worry too much about what people are going to think, and if you're going to do anything, you're going to take all kind of heat. I mean, so did Miles, so did Carlos. You know, I mean, so you know, well, just go through. <laughs> you know. You, you're talking Carlos. Now you're talking about the legacy of bass players, David Brown, Alfonso, Doug Rausch, Stanley Clark, uh, Pablo Telez, the great Dave Margin, all those guys. I mean, Carlos, again, very, very heavy. All those songs are based on bass lines. All his yeah. yeah, bass and conga, man. That's like, you know, yeah. that's it, you know. <laughs> I know, yeah, again, learned so much from these drummers. Now, that's the other thing, these guys. Armando. They always, well, they always loved great drummers, so... For me as a bass player, getting to play with Armando and Raul and Carl, that, and that's just the percussionists. I mean, right, uh, the drummers that came through, I mean, Horacio Hernandez, mm-hmm. I mean, Dennis Chambers. I mean, it's crazy, you know, like uh, a bat, oh, when I started with Walfredo Reyes Jr., mm-hmm. such, you know, I mean, there, it's just been a string of great drummers to this day, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, so for a bass player... It's great. I learned a lot. They really keep me on my toes. <laughs> you have to navigate between all the polyrhythms. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of it is from different traditions, you know, the whole yes. songo and, you know, um, mambo stuff. And it, it really has been a great training ground for being, you know, trying to stay, be the anchor that everybody needs you to be, you know. It's been fun and really harrowing at times you know especially when you get all these like insane drummers and percussionists all playing together and then you got you know chester or dave matthews you know wailing and you have carlos going you know like like <laughs> it really help it really focuses you you're really like okay i gotta be here and try right. to find that universal one between all of them, you know? And uh, so it's it, it's been, uh, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, in a lot of David Brown's parts are actually written into the song. So I'm sure you had to do your homework 
Well, in that case, I grew up playing that stuff. Yeah, okay. So I already knew those All lines, right. you know. And I actually, even to this day, I revisit a lot of this, this original recordings because they're perfect bass lines. So, and I don't, in some of the songs, in the classic songs, I don't, I don't vary it at all. I, yeah. I try to stick exactly to what he did because it's so, it's so elemental. You know, it'd be like, you know, I'm trying to cook rice, you know, without water or something, you know. Uh, what a weird analogy. Wow. <laughs> I understand it. That's what's making me freak out a little bit, you know. Yeah. I, I, right. I understand what you were saying. That's scaring me. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you cook rice. Then that's good. <laughs> Now, talk about the feeling among the, you know, I, I know when you joined Carlos, it was shortly after that, or not too long after, when he had the, the big, the nine Grammy Award winning record. And it's sort uh, of re really No, I joined it actually in, two, in uh, 1990. No, I joined in, what, what am I talking about? I joined in 1990. But... <laughs> right, so you were there for his reason, because he was, you know, I mean, obviously he was still a, lo- a big draw on the road, always was. Well, though the records weren't as commercially successful. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they, it was like we were like the biggest jam band and right, loud right. jam band. And there was always this intense following. Uh, those are yeah. great, great days. And then, yeah, 10 years later, you know, we do this album and it's like, oh, wow, you know. So, so it's, all, it's all been a great ride. And how was Carlos with being on top of the pop charts again? Because now all of a sudden you, got, you guys were in heavy rotation on MTV and mm-hmm. all of a sudden, a whole new generation. Yeah. I can't home. tell you. you know, like, a lot of people is like, what? You're still around? What? You know, I, <laughs> a lot of my friends. That was a trip. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was fun and really, it was just fun. When you look back with just with uh, with Miles and Carlos, what, what are some of the shows and, and records that stand out most to you? Uh, shows? There's a lot of them. I mean, um, a lot of shows. Any one in particular? Probably uh, Rock and Rio uh, in... Uh, 1991, maybe. I don't know. There's so many. Rock and Rio, when I, when I heard the whole audience of like whatever, 100,000 people or however many, um, they're all saying along to Javon's Oceano. That really moved me. I mean, I was like chicken skin to this day, you know. Um, there's a, a lot of the festivals that we did, Montreux. Uh, okay. Carlos always had this mad scientist ideas and they always sound like they're going to be really crazy and they're not going to work, but they always work out in, in some <laughs> way. And I, I swear to God, it's see, I've seen it time and time again. So, so yeah, that time at Montreux, we had Chick Corea and, you know, RIP, um, you know, Herbie and Wayne playing and John McLaughlin. I was like, oh, my God, I'm like, you know, <laughs> on stage with my, you know, like. With your idols, you, sure. Four of my ear, not just one, you know. <laughs> I'm like, damn, you know, I definitely was a little no worthy moment, you know, <laughs> but uh, that was fun. Uh, what What are some of the tools of the trade you were using uh, uh, with my, I know you, you what, you're, you, you probably, I, I think I saw you with, with Carlos, you were using a music man, right? You're using Stingray? Yeah, not lately. I've been, yeah, I've been doing a Sterling Deluxe uh, okay. for actually a number of years now. They're good, especially on the road. They seem to hold up. To the okay. rigors of you know that traveling on their trucks and all that yeah. bumping and all over, overseas and all that stuff that happens. So yeah, they they seem to really hold up pretty well. I like the tone. I've done a lot of recording with them, and I okay. love the the five position switch. I got I got my first one from Rainbow Guitars in Tucson, Arizona. I believe it's either Tucson or Phoenix, but I think it's in Tucson, and it was like this is cool. You know, I've never had a, a five position pickup bass before. It was Pretty awesome. Yeah, so that that's that was hooked ever since. Um, yeah. uh-huh. That was probably a good eight years ago, maybe. Or something. All right. But I've used a lot. I mean, uh, with Miles, I was using a Tune Bass Maniac Deluxe. Oh, I remember those. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I used the same bass on Smooth actually too. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. So and it worked for a while. It was, the scale is a little smaller and, or mm-hmm. something, and. Uh, but it really worked well for a while, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love it. I still got it. So yeah, yeah, nice light yeah. instruments. Those are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I I kind of bastardized it by putting. I think I put uh, EMGs in it at one point um, and a hip shot key. But other than that, yeah, it's. A, 
And then you, I think you, uh, Lakeland, you use Lakeland on any of the records? No, I think maybe a little bit. Not on a lot of recordings, I use my MTV actually, also, mm-hmm. and I still have my MTV five. Okay, um, yeah, and it's also a great bass. You know, I didn't take it on the road as much because you know, it you know, it's a really I didn't want to like because that life on the road is kind of harsh, you know, so, <laughs> as for for instruments. So basically, yeah, I wanted to keep that in more pristine condition, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he makes great basses. That guy, you know, I use all kinds of basses, you know. It's like the other thing I tell my students is it's mostly in the hands, you know. Right, right. They're, I just tell them how many things they can actually do without changing any tone controls at all, not touching anything, you know. I mean, it's a really big part of all our favorite bass players' sounds, you know. Yeah. It's how they play it. It's not, it's not what... They played so much. It's really how you know, right? I know because I've I've I had a Rickenbacker, and I never sounded like Chris Squire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah, no, not really. <laughs> so that may be um, the most uncomfortable bass, bar none. It is, it is. But hey, he rocked it, man. So oh, yeah. like, and it looks so cool. It looks amazing. Oh yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I, you know, you're talking I don't know. about your, your students. Um, I'm in the middle of a new book now. Um, it's called Keyboard for Bass. Oh, cool. Very cool. You know, it's just triads and different inversions and seventh chords and how you that's build it. Very. So that's that great. they could literally hit a chord and then play a couple of. To oh, me, that's really totally useful. That's really useful. Yeah, the harmony is, is just so important and, and to yeah, be yeah, yeah. rooted in that. We're looking forward to it. You know, it's interesting. You you talk about we talk about Carlos, we talk about Miles. We're talking about album artists, and now we live in the days of Spotify and streaming. As David and I, uh, we talk about this all the time. Yeah. Uh, is it the best of times? Is it the worst of times? Is the album experience like we talk about Bitches Brew or On the Corner or Santana One Two Three Caravanarsi and all those great records? Is the album still a viable format? I think, you know, I think both, actually. There is there is a growing number of people that do deep listening now. Well, there was even a great article in the LA Times just reminding people, hey, this is here's something you can do with your time while you're in uh, quarantine. So there is, and there's still, uh, vinyl sales are actually kind of going through yeah. the roof. I see it's really bifurcated, you know, where there's the, you know, the, the functionary, functional, I need some music to put on while I'm cooking or at my party or whatever. And then there's the other people that really like to listen. And people are still doing albums. I mean, some of my favorite favorite uh, young new bands are doing albums. I mean, I think I see it as just a bifurcated market. I, I think that if someone, an artist, hears that, okay, I want to present an album, they should do it. If they just like, well, I just, I'm only hearing two or three songs in this offering, they should do that. I mean, it's sort of like now more than ever, you got to just kind of know your market, know mm-hmm. who you're playing to, you know, so to speak. And, you know, kind of go from there. You know, there's there's certain demographics that really like vinyl and certain that will never, ever have vinyl again. You know? yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's maybe tougher to figure out. I mean, it was always work anyway, you know. It was either hard work with a Tascam Porta Studio or now. Yeah. So I tell my son that it's like, just get used to doing work because you're not going to get around it. No matter what, how many pieces of cool software gear you have, there's going to be a lot of work involved if you ever want to do anything that's different than anything else, anybody else. So, so. Very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Sure. Well, as an educator, what, how, you know, your students now are born into a YouTube generation where they can get, they, they can, they can watch the masters on YouTube a far cry from, you know, uh, yeah. Benny putting on the record and trying to figure out the baseline. Yeah, <laughs> trying, to, trying to slap with my palm or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, I I celebrate that. That's great. You yeah, know, it um, is. Yeah, I'd rather have them doing that than you know doing drugs and killing people. So hey, I I say go for it. All mm-hmm. and you know, if they get some misinformation, so what? They always got misinformation. That's that's not a new thing. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I say do it, do it all. You know, just. And like, I have a student that actually is taking lessons from three different people, you know, and I say, great, that's fine. You know, like, I'm going to tell you what I know and what works for me and you can adapt 
I mean, take what you want. People have to get what they put in, what they get out of it. You know, so well, it's interesting because multiple we, uh, David, we were talking to Larry Grenadier, and he, he was saying how important it is for classical upright mm-hmm. players to study jazz and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Larry, Larry's badass. I I <laughs> kind of knew him a long time in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I there's this kid. Oh my God! I just saw this uh, guitar player. He's doing all these transcriptions of Shostakovich. He even did Right to Spring, all in guitar. You're not going to believe this guy. <laughs> it's like, and literally, I'm not talking about a, an arrangement of Riots of Springs. You get the entire suite, all both, you know, the adoration, every, all on uh, everything. Um, Joe Parrish is this guitar. Oh, Joe Parrish. Okay, I'm thinking about that. It's stupid. It's great. There's a lot of great young artists around, um, which is great for me, you know, because you know. Remember we started hearing, you know, oh, millennials can't play their music. Ah, it's all push button, blah, 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 you know, and all this shit. But, man, I'm telling you, sorry, you know, I there's so many ag- amazing players out there that, you know, like I was like, wow, shit, I better start practicing. These well, guys. The information is out there. You think also you talk about the trend. You, you were – uh, your your career uh, is embodies the addition of analog to digital. Now, yeah, yeah. obviously, in the days of tape, you really had to be an efficient player because yeah. you know you you can't erase tape, so you can only erase yeah. tape so many times. So you know there was a certain level of proficiencies, like we talk about the studio masters, you know the the Duck Duns and the Willies and the sure, Davis yeah, and yeah. Grosses and those people uh, who can just nail it in one take. And then of course you have Pro Tools. Well, you can nail it in a thousand takes, or maybe you can just cut and paste it in a sure. thousand. But I always, I tell my, well, like I tell my son and also other people, it hasn't stopped these guys from learning how to play. And okay. I tell them that, that the, the advantage of that is, A, producers do not want to, st- I know, I don't want to stand there, sit there after the session and fix shit. It's the worst thing to do. Almost any producer, you yeah. know, after that initial, like, you know how we get enamored of a technology, you know? Yeah. After that initial, like, ooh, love love affair, you re- quickly realize, we all quickly realized, this sucks, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and most producers will tell you, I'd rather just have some guy nail the ship and we can move on, you know, and put something together. And so there's still a real value to being proficient. Uh, I think, you know, people maybe don't realize it, but but the, the bands I listen to, they certainly know the the value of proficiency. I mean, the magic of, of nailing something on the first take or second take, which I wanted to ask you, one of my favorite records you've done recently was the one with the uh, Isley brothers, Santana and the Isley brothers. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Higher ground. Are you ready? Was that, a, was that kind of like a first or second take record? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. That's kind of the, that's Carlos's MO basically. Let's, yeah. let's, let's go in there and blaze and do it. I mean, smooth was the, the second take actually. Okay. The rhythm track, because we got one take. I remember Matt, the producer, we did it. We finally learned the song. Like, yeah. Okay, we got the take. And, you know, there were no mistakes. So, you know, it was great. Okay, cool. And then he said, okay, can you play it again? But this time, like you're at a rock show, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. So we, we all had fun with it. And that's the take. That's that's the rhythm track that's on there. Wow. So there is always going to be value in the proficiency and sure. bringing it. And then, not to mention, not play live, you can't fake it. <laughs> right, so, there's no Pro Tools on stage with you. Yeah, you know, like, wait a minute, can we do that again? No. <laughs> I think for a while it looked, it always looks like a new technology is the end of everything. Right, right. But it generally never is, you know, it just makes us better. Um, now I hear, because, <laughs> you know, singers are listening to all these autotunes performances, and so they're working on their shit so they don't need autotune. <laughs> it's, it's really bizarre. It's great, and they could. They, as a result, their pitch is way great. You know, so you know. I mean, I'm all for it, man. So yeah. The- Funny to hear. You know, one, every once in a while, my wife and I'll tune into Z100 uh, just to hear what the kids are listening to, and it's 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 amazing to hear Carlos sampled so many times. My wife, because that sounds like Carlos Santana. I'm like, yeah, it's because it is Carlos Santana, and and so many times the rhythm yeah. section from your records are are sampled. I get. I guess still, I don't listen to that. That, yeah, nor do I, but when I do, I can pick it out. Yeah, yeah. It's But <laughs> like I said before, though, it does seem like there's another, like there's that music, you know, yeah. like functional McDonald's kind of music. And, and yeah, and it's all good, you know. But then there's another smaller, but I mean, it's burgeoning also, the whole scene of like 
you know, there's a band called Lawrence, which is one of them. Um, they have a big following. They played at the L.A. Wiltern Theater here. And uh, there's a lot of people that listen to other kinds of music. Lawrence is this great duo from Brooklyn, actually. They're just these kids that do stuff in their living room. But it's great playing and great songs, actually. They take a lot from Stevie, you know, the, you know, but Lawrence is more of a pop band, but they bring it. They don't, they're not, it's not sampled stuff and all that. It's like, oh, let's, let's play it, you know, and let's create a groove, an actual groove. And like, wow. And they're stretching the time, you know, it, they're some great, there are a lot of great things happening that most uh, of us boomers don't realize or have. Yeah. And, you know, but on that on that thread now, what what do you think? Now again, you're you're born of an era with the record company and the record label and the record deal. Yeah. Now musicians can go directly to the marketplace. Again, best of times, the worst of times. You don't have that record company sure. muscle behind yeah. you, but yeah. you can be like this Lawrence that can create their own audience. Yeah, and it, and again, it's a ton of work. I don't, you know, it's not. A- magic bullet hit time or anything like that i mean you i'm sure you ask those guys it's like yeah and they they sweat but you know if you really you know it's like my friend said you know like if it was easy everyone would do it you know so yeah. you got to get in there and kick ass you know yeah. and kicking ass nowadays looks different there are different procedures to that but it's the same thing you got to come up with it you got to do whatever it takes you know which is, and i like that personally I, I i find much joy and inspiration from those guys you know so you know, so yeah. So I I advise you to listen to some of these bands. You, I will you, do that. We're gonna yeah, it'll restore your faith in humanity. If nothing else. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something, Betty. One of the things that um, I actually wrote down over here is, you know, we've been doing these interviews for a, a few weeks now. We've got about nine or ten different folks, That's and cool. I wrote down, find out what they're listening to. Well, let's see. Lawrence, uh, the Funky Knuckles. They're from Dallas. That oh that bass player Wes Stevenson he's one of my favorite of the new guys I mean the whole band actually really plays that song it's scary a really good prog band District ninety seven from Chicago there's all these amazing the, the depth of their stuff you know lyrically and musically you know, really nuts really crazy yeah and then for fun there's a band called Panzerballet which they're from Germany yeah yeah. <laughs> my son, and actually, my son has turned me on to all of these bands. By the way, they have this version of some skunk funk. Do you remember that song? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay, if you listen to that, and you don't, if you if you don't just keep laughing and going, <laughs> oh my god, you're you're you're, you're dead because you know uh, it's it's insane. And a lot of it is some of that they're like really math rock, so. It's yeah. not a lot of emotional content, but they really bring in a lot more influences. These kids these days, you know, Prague in the in the day was all rock and classical, but they're yeah, bringing yeah. jazz. Uh, you know, they're bringing all kinds of influences. Oh man, there's so, there's there's a lot of good ones out there. You know, so well, that's nice to know. And it's also it seems that everyone we we're talking to now, everyone is really excited about the future, positive about their music, humble and and grateful for everything that's gone. It's nice to see. It's really nice to see. Yeah, and that I think that's part of it for me too. You know, the whole just seeing that kind of like spark. You know, and I was like, oh, and now I know why Carlos and Miles and these people always like younger bands because that energy is fantastic. That sort of kind of like, yeah, you know, bring it, you know, like I got something to say here. And also the sense of exploration. Oh, Reign of Kindo, another really cool band. God, there's some, there's a lot of amazing stuff happening out there. So, but yeah, you got to talk to Wes Stevenson. He's, he's the guy, you know. <laughs> well, I like Funky Knuckles. I think that's, that's, that's a, a great name. Those guys, uh, and Wes sits down, a la Anthony Jackson. I, I, at first I thought, oh, is he a midget or something? Because <laughs> like, you know, it was a weird angle. I was like, wait, oh, shit, he's sitting down. <laughs> but, uh, and the tone, really great tone. I mean, that's... Well, that's great. That's great. It, it's going to give our listeners also a lot of things. Yeah, do. please. And also on that, speaking of streaming, I have to just, um, this is my personal rant. I have to tell everybody that if you hear something you like, some new band, indie band, buy their shit, please. Don't just stream it. You got to right. buy it because and then it just goes away. Yeah. Because streaming, they don't get the money as much, you know. Yeah, pennies on the pennies on the. I like I do the subscription thing, but I I buy stuff I like yeah. because the subscription money goes to the company most of the time. The large percentage of it, you know. If people could remember, please buy the stuff. Yeah, that's a great thing to say. Yeah. yeah. 
Great stuff, gentlemen. Thank you. Adios. Be well. All the best. Stay safe. Stay strong. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. Thanks so much for listening. I want to shout out to Tom Semioli, my co-host and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, and to... That's right, Benny Reitfeld. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with Jerry McAvoy of Rory Gallagher. So you guys take care. We'll see you next week. 